Good morning. One of the young ladies in the church made me this bookmark, and I realized I'm, I just found it up here. I left it up here from the first service. All right. Oh, everything's fine. Well, I have a question for you to begin our time this morning, which is this. Uh, what does the car that you drive say about you? What does the car that you drive say about you? This is like a, an old trope, right? People say this stuff all the time. It's really weird to talk about this on Palm Sunday, but uh, I'm going to talk about it anyway because I think it makes my point. In other words, what if you drove this to church today? What would that say about you, right? Uh, would it say, for example, I like to go fast? Maybe. Yeah, I like to go fast. Uh, uh, maybe you want to be seen, right? Look at me. Look at this fancy car that I'm driving. I want to be seen. I don't know. There's probably a whole host of things that we could come up with if we thought about it long enough. What if you drive a car like this? Uh, what would that say about you? My father-in-law collects a couple of, he's got a couple of vintage cars. I don't think he's got anything this old. His stuff is from like the 60s and 70s. But uh, it's nostalgia, right? So you, you might be thinking, hey, this, this car takes me back to my childhood. Or uh, perhaps you're one of those people that say, you know, they don't make them like they used to, right? Now, I, for one, <clears throat> my first car was a 1973 Chevy pickup with the floorboards rusted out so you could see the road when you drove. And uh, I miss that thing, but I do not miss the carburetor, like at all. I, I uh, learned how to adjust a carburetor on that car, and I fought with it quite a bit. Well, what if your car is like this? What's that say about you, right? It may say things like, I just need cheap transportation, right? It also may say about you, I've picked up a new hobby in my life, which is automobile repair, right? Because you're going to be working on this thing a lot. That is an AMC Gremlin, uh, which for you young people was not a reliable car. <clears throat> what, if you're, what if you drove this? Uh, perhaps you drove a, car, a truck like this, you would say, uh, I work hard. Or maybe it says about you, I grew up in the country, right? Or perhaps it says about you, I want to help you move into your new home or apartment. <laughs> I, keep, I keep wanting to buy a pickup truck just as my daily driver, and everybody warns me, if you do that, you will be asked to move people. Uh, or you might drive a Honda CRV, which just says that you're extraordinarily intelligent because of the all-wheel drive <laughs> and the versatility of this wonderful vehicle that's made in Marysville, Ohio, just down the road. That's what I drive, just in case you guys didn't pick that up. Okay. Folks have argued for a long time, people have said for a long time, that the car you drive says something about you as a person. And on Palm Sunday, we are talking about the Sunday where Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but he didn't use his normal mode of transportation, which would have been on foot. In this case, Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And he rode in on a donkey. And I want to argue with you today, or I want, to, I want to explain to you today why this is so significant. Because whether you know it or not, it is extraordinarily intentional and appropriate and meaningful, filled with meaning, that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And today I'll attempt to, you, to explain to you why that's so significant. The big question that we're going to wrestle with today then is this. What does Jesus' entry into Jerusalem before his crucifixion communicate to us about his life? What does it say to us? How, does it, how, does, how are we better explained who Jesus was and what his mission was by the way he entered Jerusalem? Today, my outline is a bit different than normal. I want to go through some scriptures first and then kind of present an outline after that. So if you'll just bear with me, um, I'm very excited to share this with you. So let's first go to look at the actual triumphal entry from John's, in John's gospel. So turn with me to John chapter 12, and I'll just read a little bit in there, John chapter 12, and we'll start in verse 12 and read all the way to 19. I'll read, you just follow along, John chapter 12. Verse 12 says, The next day, 
the large crowd that had come to the feast. Let's just stop right there and let me give you some context. Because if you don't read the Bible in its context, it, you can really twist it around and make it mean whatever you want. But we read the Bible in its context. So the context here, what's the big feast? It's the time of Passover. Passover was a Jewish celebration, still is to this day, a Jewish celebration where people would gather and celebrate what God had done for the nation of Israel in leading it out of Egypt when they were being oppressed by the Egyptians, leading them out of Egypt and into the promised land. And God did that in a very miraculous way. He sent plagues, right? He raised up Moses, first of all, but then he sent plagues. And at the, at the very end, he commanded the people of Israel to make a sacrifice and dip some uh, hyssop in some blood and smear the blood on the door frame of their home. And the angel of the Lord would be sent, and, and if the angel of the Lord saw the blood on the door frame, the angel would pass over that house. But for every house that did not have that blood on the door frame, the firstborn would die. That was enough. That's what God did, and that was enough to allow Pharaoh to relent, at least temporarily, and say, get out. And so God rescued the people of Israel out of Egypt. You know the rest of the story. Pharaoh changes his mind. He sends the armies after them. They're pursuing them. The Red Sea opens. They cross. The army pursues. The Red Sea closes in. The army perishes. A group of ragtags and, and uh, a group of uh, people that don't have any weapons, God gave them victory over the army of Egypt. So they gather and they celebrate this thing in Jerusalem every year. There's people getting together, there's feasts, it's a big thing. Back to the text. The next day, at the, lar the large crowd had come to the feast, <clears throat> heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him, I always love it when the Bible, when God just gives us the reason. The reason why the crowd went out to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign, that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. All right, let's just stop right there. And let me just make a few observations before we move on. The first observation I want to make is that the crowd is very excited, right? The crowd is there. They're in, the city is full, right? All the hotels are full. This is like trying to find a hotel room on a Ohio, Ohio State Buckeye home game, right? It's impossible, right? All the hotels even in Delaware are filled up on a game day, right? But the, the city is filled with uh, celebrants. You know, they're all gathered to celebrate the Passover, and so this large crowd is there, and they're excited. They're cutting up palm branches. One of the gospel accounts, I think it's Mark, uh, said that they were laying their cloaks down before Jesus. And they're waving, and they're, and they're saying, uh, bless, you know, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So my first observation is the crowd is excited. Now, I want to point out to you, just as an aside, it doesn't take a whole lot to get us excited as human beings, does it? I mean, what is it right now? March Madness. There's a whole lot of people getting very excited about what? About two groups of people that can chuck a ball into a metal rim. Right? Now listen, I'm an Indiana boy, and they get pretty excited about that stuff over there. And I've noticed a few things in my time on this earth, and that is, is that the closer the game is between who can chuck the ball into the metal rim uh, more times than the other team, the closer that it is in the score, the more excited people get. And they scream and they yell. 
And when the, when the game comes down to the last few seconds, right, and one team is down by two and somebody shoots the ball from way far away, which they give you three points for if you shoot it from way far away, if somebody shoots a ball from way far away and it, and it goes through the metal rim right as the clock is expiring, I mean, people go apoplectic. They run around, they high-five, they fist bump, they scream. It's nuts, right? I, I heard the uh, uh, Delaware Hayes got into the uh, Indiana State Final Four and the game was won by one point. Uh, but they lost. You know, the, the, uh, Delaware Hayes lost. That's sad, but, you know, people were very excited at the game. I've also noticed something else interesting about this game, March Madness basketball, is that <clears throat> when the score is tied and someone has just committed a foul, there's just a, a second or two left on the clock, and somebody steps up to the free throw line, if they pan around the crowd, you'll oftentimes see people doing this. <laughs> now, th some of them, about half, are praying that the shot goes in. And the other half are praying that it doesn't. <laughs> Hoping for over, they're praying for overtime, right? I say all this to say it's not very difficult for us as human beings to get excited. And that's what we see in this crowd. We see excited people. The next observation I'll make about this crowd is that the text makes it clear that they are there to see the spectacle of Jesus. In other words, this city is not full because Jesus is arriving. The city is full because of the Passover. And word gets around that Jesus is coming into town. Yes, that Jesus that we've heard has raised this guy Lazarus from the dead. And so they go out to meet him. They're there to see the spectacle. Perhaps, I don't know what they were thinking. The text doesn't tell us that. But perhaps they were thinking, you know, perhaps the reason why they exclaimed that he was the king of Israel is because they thought, boy, if a guy is strong enough, if he's powerful enough to raise someone from the dead, which, you know, that never happens. If he's powerful enough to raise somebody from the dead, perhaps he could liberate us from this Roman Empire that we're under right now. Who knows? But the crowd is very excited, and they're out there to see the spectacle of Jesus the third observation I would make that's also in the text is that his disciples did not understand what was happening or the significance of this moment. They remembered it later. As it was happening, they were clueless. Later on, they remembered, oh yeah, this was an important, this was an important thing, the fact that Jesus came into Jerusalem, that he was recognized as the king, and that he was riding on the back of a donkey. Now, in John's gospel, in John, chapter, in John chapter 12, verse 15, there's a quote. In my Bible, in my ESV Bible, there's a space, extra space above that quote, extra space below it, and it's kind of set off. It's, it's indent is set off, and that's signaling to us, at least the ESV translators are signaling to us, that that's an Old Testament quotation. And it even says in the, uh, in the footnotes that it's from Zechariah. And before I go to Zechariah, which is where I'm going to go next, so you can, you know, here's Jesus coming into the town on a, on a donkey. Uh, before we get to Zechariah, let, let me just say a few words about why we're going to go there here in a minute. Uh, I don't know about you, and I know I'm getting older, but, and I've shared this with you before, when I hear a song, lyric, or I hear distantly on the radio or somebody's playing music, and I hear a song, it takes me, oftentimes it transports me to a different time, different place. Like, when I hear that song by uh, that one guy, I don't even know his name, but it's the Lady in Red. They play it at, like, weddings and stuff. I don't know if you've heard that. It's like a slow dance song. It just takes me back to high school. Like, I'm in high school. I'm at my high school dance. This really nifty-looking young lady named Tracy is dancing with me. That song is playing. I can smell the smells. I can see the sights in the West Central High School cafeteria. <laughs> it takes me back. When I hear Rich Mullins songs, any one of them, it takes me back to my college years because that's what I was listening to all throughout my time at Purdue. Just one lyric quoted from, that, from any of those songs it just takes me back. Well, I want to argue with you this morning, or argue to you, make a case that 
when John quotes Zechariah, what he's, he's telling us more than just to pay attention to that one lyric, that one line. He's probably, at least for the Jewish readers, would have, would have filled their minds with, what did Zechariah say? So I want to take you, invite you to take your Bibles and turn back to the Old Testament prophet, Zechariah. It's later in the Old Testament. It's one of the 12 minor, Zechariah is one of the 12 minor prophets who was speaking and writing during the time after the exile in Jerusalem. In other words, it's good that we're studying Daniel right now because you've kind of got the Babylonian exile in your mind, right? So we've been studying Daniel. After the Persian Empire takes hold, they begin to let you know, when the 70-year Babylonian exile comes to a close, they begin to let Jewish people head back to Jerusalem, and there's a group of people that start rebuilding the walls and start rebuilding the temple and start kind of resuming life in Jerusalem. And it's, it's hard. It's extraordinarily hard, tough going. And Zechariah is one of the prophets who prophesies and speaks to the people of Israel to encourage them and to challenge them during this time. So what I'm going to do this morning, and what I'm going to attempt to do in the next like five to ten minutes, is just to give you an overview of Zechariah so that you'll have it in your head as we move forward. <clears throat> first, let me just read to you the first six verses, because this is kind of the introduction to the book. Zechariah chapter 1. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, that's one of the Persian kings, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore I say to them, thus, says, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, whom the former prophets cried out, to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds, but they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I command my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so he has dealt with us. So this is the introduction to the book. It's not, an easy, it's not an easy message. And I just want to tell you, in case your English Western ears didn't pick up on this, Zechariah said something in this text that would have perked up the ears of every Jewish listener to the max. And that is this. Verse 5, your fathers, where are they? And this is what he meant by that. I, I, this is what scholars think that Zechariah meant by that is that is this if you look at if you look at the the city of Jerusalem today outside the walls of the old city you're going to see what a humongous cemetery of, of a lot of Jewish people that are buried there outside the city walls why Jewish thinking and Jewish culture where you are buried is a big deal you'll see several instances in the old testament of somebody said when I die you put my bones here when I die, you bury me there. They're very, very, it's very important to them of where they are laid to rest. And this generation that Zechariah is talking to, when he says, your fathers, where are they? They know. Their bone, the bones of their fathers are where? They're in Babylon. They were buried in exile for what they had done. It was a shame to them. The prophets, do they live forever? In other words, God sends these men to speak, to write, to prophesy, to warn the people of Israel. You better repent. You better repent. You better turn from your ways. And the people did not listen. And so finally what had happened was is that their fathers, when they were in exile, finally repented and said, as the Lord of hosts has pur pur purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so he has dealt with us. We are in exile, and we are in exile because of what we have done. This is the opening to Zechariah. Now, I don't have time, obviously, to read 14 chapters this morning out of Zechariah, but I can provide a brief overview. And what Zechariah sees next 
is a series of visions and in a weird kind of order where the visions kind of start out expressing something and they work their way to a center uh, point and then they work their way back out. I know you can't read this. I'm, I'll, I'll explain it. But I, I'm just saying that Zechariah these vision, he's given these visions and these visions span from Israel's past all the way to Israel's future. So these things are designed to be both a warning and a hope. And so we start off with these visions, and, and the first vision that is seen is, is the, these horse rangers, these men on horse that are patrolling the earth, and they come back with a report that the land is at rest, the land is at peace. The Babylonian Empire has been defeated, the Persian Empire, we think, we think this is what this, he's saying, the Persian Empire has taken hold and has brought a time of relative peace in the territory, right? The second vision that he receives is uh, a, a vision of horns and blacksmiths, and we think that that horns typically represents kings, it represents uh, Gentile kings, not Jewish kings, and so there's been this time of the Gentile kings that God uses these Gentile kings to discipline his people, Israel. And then there's a, a measuring line is brought, is brought up, and I brought my tape measure from my office that I use from time to time. And uh, when do you get out of measuring line? You get out of measuring line when you're going to build something or make sure something fits somewhere, something like that. And so scholars believe that this measuring line, well, I think the text actually says that this measuring line represents the idea that Jerusalem will be restored. It will be rebuilt. And then we kind of get to the center core of these visions. There's, there's two kind of in the center, and one is Joshua who is wearing these filthy garments. And these filthy garments are taken off of him and they're replaced by clean garments, indicating the, the cleansing of sin and the restoring of Israel through the, res the restoration of the priesthood. And then still in the center of these visions, we see Zerubbabel, who is in the line of David and has been appointed governor over Jerusalem by the, by the Persians. But uh, this is a guy who's in the line of David. And so they're, you know, they're, he's given an image of, of being a king a descendant of David will rule again. And then working our way, now we're working our way back out of the center point of the vision. Okay, so if, if the third vision, the measuring line was Jerusalem will re be restored, then six, the, the sixth vision is a flying scroll indicating that the people of Israel will once again heed the word of the Lord. They will listen and obey the word of the Lord, right? The people of God are going to hear and obey. And again, we're working our way back out. As in vision two, talked about horns and blacksmiths and the conquering of Israel or the disciplining of Israel by four nations. This woman in a basket is, is said to be depicting Israel being carried off into exile. And then the eighth and final vision, well, the eighth vision, there's one more. The eighth vision is chariot rangers. So you had horse rangers patrolling the earth and saying, declaring, hey, the earth is at relative peace. And then now you have these chariot rangers that are riding around and they're saying kind of the same thing. Babylon is defeated and the land is at relative peace. This is a powerful structure. It starts with what has happened in Israel's past and it works its way into the center and it talks about Israel's future, the restoration of Israel, the restoration of the high priesthood and the king and all these kinds of things. There's a bonus vision at the latter part of verse 6, or chapter 6, there's a bonus vision, not, not a bonus vision, but an, another vision of a, a man who is depicted and called the branch, capital B in my Bible, the branch. And he is of the line of David and will be the king. And again, we think that that's talking about Christ. And so from there, after all these weird and wacky visions that Zechariah sees in these, in these chapters, in chapters 7 and 8, the question is, is asked, is it time to stop grieving? Is it time, you know, is it time for us to stop grieving and, and, and live in joy once again? And then we get chapters 9 through 11. Chapters 9 through 11 of Zechariah's prophecy, we believe, talks about the, the coming of a Messiah. And it's 9 through 11, and in, within that section... Chapter 9, verse 9, is this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
That is, this is the passage that we believe John quotes from as he's talking about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey that within Zechariah's prophecy talking about you, your fathers didn't obey, here's kind of a hist historical and a future snapshot of what's going on in Israel through all these visions. Is it time to stop grieving? And then it talks about the, the first advent of Christ coming talking about salvation and rejoicing. But then, the last three chapters, chapters 12, 13, and 14, are kind of another vision of an, or, or another prophecy of a, of a coming kingdom. And it is thought that, that kingdom, that, that, that those chapters are depicting Jesus' second coming. The new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and all that. Now, that's kind of an overview of what's going on. And, and again, what I'm saying is, is that when John quotes Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, to at least the Jewish audience, what, what they would have called to their mind is Zechariah's entire prophecy. Maybe, at least the ones that understood God's word. They would have understood that entire prophecy and all that was contained in it. Now, I want to share one more passage with you. And that's Revelation 19. So you can turn there. Revelation, obviously, is also written by, well, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. It's also written by John. John wrote the Gospel of John, and then John wrote the Revelation at the end of the Bible. Or at least that's what's put as the last chapter, or the last book in our Bibles. And in Revelation 19... John sees in his visions the coming of the king. And this is how it is depicted. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. Buckle up. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one else knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called out to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast with the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who is in its presence, who is in its presence, had, oops, sorry, who in its presence had done the signs by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that comes from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And the birds, all the birds, were gorged with their flesh. In Jesus' first advent, he comes to Jerusalem on the back of a donkey to lay down his life. In his second advent, he will come on a war horse with a sword with the armies that are not necessary because he's going to strike them down. He's going to strike down his enemies before him. Now, all, with all that in your mind, a few things to think about. By the way, this is a depiction of that episode. And I just want to say, 
on behalf of the entire church of Jesus Christ globally. If you're a young person and you're thinking about going into the arts, boy, we could use a lot better artistic stuff as it pertains to biblical imagery. I mean, this is an okay picture, but I, we could do better. So go into, go into the arts and then make this your, make this your task. There seems to be a pattern that God follows uh, as he works with his people throughout history. And I just want to point that pattern out to you this morning as by way of encouragement and challenge. Encouragement and challenge. And that is this. God often meets us with his grace. He leads with his grace. When, when the whole earth through Adam and Eve had rebelled against God, and you know, God in his grace flooded the whole earth but saved Noah and his family right? In other words, all of sinful humanity deserved to be wiped out. God did not do that. God rescued Noah and his family. From that, the offspring of that, uh, though the whole earth was descending into chaos more, sin still prevailed on the earth. God, in his grace, chose one man, Abraham, out of which to make a great nation to bless all the nations of the earth through this one man and his family, Abraham. God, grace extended to the people of Israel. Though they were in captivity in Egypt, subjugated into slavery, God rescued them out of the hand of Pharaoh and brought them into a land that he promised them, that he promised to Abraham. He brought them back into that land and allowed them to flourish there, defeating enemies that they did not have the training or the weaponry to defeat. God gave them victory. This is very, a very gracious God that we serve. And in his magnum opus, God sent his only son, to pay for our sin. And though Jesus, with a word, could have disintegrated Jerusalem, he humbly rode in on the back of a donkey, signaling peace and his grace. And he laid down his life voluntarily so that we could be the beneficiaries of his grace, of we, that we could receive that which we do not reserve, deserve, sorry, that we do not deserve to be forgiven of our sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Our God often, in, in this pattern, God often leads with grace. He was patient with Israel for a very long time before he put them into exile. He endured many kings who said, I am the king of Israel. We, Israel, are God's people, and yet did deplorable acts and brought idolatry, false gods into the land of Israel and polluted and corrupted everything. God is gracious. But our God is also a God of truth. God instructed Abraham what to do. Abraham didn't always follow. So that's how we got Ishmael, right? But when God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son by you and Sarah, though they were very old in age, God followed through on his promise and did it. And Isaac was born. When God brought the, the people of Israel, the house of Jacob, when he brought them out of Egypt and he put them in the promised land, he delivered to them his word. The Old Testament, the Old Testament law so that they would know how to conduct themselves as a nation in ways that were pleasing to him and good for each other. Ways of justice, but also balanced with mercy. Ways to, to, to avoid corruption. He instructed them very clearly what to do. And they did not obey his word. Today, we live on the other side of the coming of Jesus. Jesus. Jesus has delivered his teachings to us, and those teachings have been preserved for us in the New Testament. And so we have at our disposal today, the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have God's word. We have a way to live that God has outlined, that allows us to be people that live by truth in a way that brings justice 
in a way to have integrity and avoid corruption, in a way that constructs uh, systems like the nuclear family that is a, the most awesome and wonderful place to raise children and to practice loving someone even when they're not always lovely, your spouse, and receiving love when you're not always lovely from your spouse, pouring that love out on your children. We have the truth of God's word and we are instructed as his people to live in it. But we also see this third aspect of God's character and that is an aspect of wrath, of separation and destruction. Even if you didn't have the ability to read as a young Israelite growing up in the kingdom, you heard the stories from your fathers and your grandfathers of how God had, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, sent the angel of the Lord over Egypt and delivered them out of Egypt. The opening of the Red Sea, the crossing of the people, the, the closing of the Red Sea to, to vanquish all of Pharaoh's army. You've heard the stories your whole life. And yet, the people of Israel living in the, the land of promise, having received God's word and knowing exactly what they were supposed to do, ignored it. They did not listen. And when it became stylish to worship Baal, they worshiped Baal. And when it became favorable to worship Ashtoreth, well, they tacked that on too, and Moloch and a host of other false gods from the surrounding nations. When they were told not to intermarry with people of foreign, uh, the foreign people that worshiped false gods, not even King Solomon listened to that command, and his heart was turned away from God. And God sent the prophets. He sent prophets like Jeremiah to say, you'd better repent. God is very close to putting us into exile. You better repent, turn around, repent, repent, repent. And one false, one bad king after another bad king, sometimes a good king would come along, try to make some reforms, but the hearts of the people were not with God. And so those reforms, listen, we could make laws today in the United States of America that would make Christianity the legal law of the land. It doesn't change anybody's heart, amen? It doesn't. What changes a heart? It's for them to have an encounter with God and proclaim the gospel. The Holy Spirit does a work in their life and transforms them. And so they rebelled against God. By that time, the, the northern kingdom, the, Israel had split into two. The northern kingdom that was called Israel in the Bible, the southern kingdom that's called Judah in the Bible had split. In the northern kingdom, God scattered them using the Assyrians scattered them. The southern kingdom, you think that they would get their act together and, and repent and follow the Lord. They did not. And so what did God do? He brought in the Babylonians to besiege them and to carry them off into exile in the land of Babylon for 70 years. We live in a time of grace, God's grace, we live in a time of truth, the word of God. But Christ is going to return. Now, I don't know what you think about when you think about the return of Jesus Christ on that white horse with his sword out of his mouth and the armies behind him to vanquish all of his enemies. I don't know what you think about that. Do you think, woohoo, yay, finally, all the enemies of God slaughtered. Remember, our God is a God who has said in his word that he's the type of God that desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so I don't think that's going to be, I think that's going to be a very sad day. Yes, it'll be victorious and that Jesus will come and he will do what he said he was going to do. But how will we, the church, react to know that, especially if we were not really on task of spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, how is that going to feel to know that God's wrath is being poured out on the nations? How
How we live today, brothers and sisters in Christ, how we live today matters. It matters because the fastest way to shipwreck your own life, right? There's this, there's this thing, there's this saying that Christians say, right? That, that Jesus has saved me, is saving me, and someday will save me, right? And I know what the, the first one means. He has saved me. When I put my faith in Jesus Christ, he saved me from my sins. Yep. And I know what the future one means. He will save me, meaning this, I'm, at some point I'm going to shed this more mortal coil. I'm going to be given a glorified body. I'm going to be with him in the eternal state. I can't wait. But this middle part, he is saving me. What does that mean? Well, I want to I posit something in your heads to think about, which is this, is that as we shape our, as we allow our lives to be shaped by God's word, as we repent and turn away from our sin, and we, with God's help, align our lives with the word of God, it saves us from many griefs, right? A person who is a habitual liar doesn't have a lot of friends. A person who is a habitual liar doesn't have a lot of people who trust that person. So relationships can't go deep. That's just one, that's just one sin, the sin of lying. But to the degree that we shape our lives by the word of God, our lives will become freer and freer from sin and more and more rich and full, I believe. It matters how we live. It matters to the unbelieving world that's watching us to see if we're just a bunch of people who quote a bunch who quote verses but we don't live them out. It, it, it matters because the world, the unbelieving world is watching how we deal with the challenges of life, how we think, how we act. Are we people of integrity or are we just people of words? And to the degree that we're living out our faith in, a, in the midst of an unbelieving world, perhaps others will come to know Christ by the words that we speak and by the testimony that we live out. And that person will be saved on the day of wrath. Praise the Lord. The nation of Israel, at the time of the coming of Christ, when Jesus rode into that town, Jerusalem, on the back of a donkey, they were excited. They didn't really understand what was going on, but they were excited. And those very same people who wa waved those palm branches and shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the king of Israel, just one week later, would yell out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Because their hearts were not with him. They had the outward form. So this is very important to us today as we enter into Holy Week to take some personal inventory. Because the answer to the big question today is this. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem reminds us of how critically important it is for us to think deeply about who or what we love. Are you here today because it's the right thing to do to look good in front of your people, your circle, whatever? Or are you here today because you love Jesus? You want to learn more about his word. You want to walk in his ways because they are life-giving and they are, <laughs> they are refreshing and they are good. Do you want to be continuously being rescued from the sin that you are living in repentance of? Or are you just going through the motions like Old Testament Israel? It matters. It matters. So by way of possible application, just some things to think about as we depart this morning and we move into Holy Week. Who or what do you love? And more importantly, like I'm a real practical guy here, how does your life show that? If you say that you love Jesus, you love God, and yet you, you can never be found in his word, never can be found in prayer, or it's a rare occasion when you need something. I mean, I'm just being practical and honest here. then you've got, you've got to wrestle with that, right? I'm not with you in the morning when you get up or when you lie down, or when you do your quiet time or what you think about. I'm not with you during those times. Who or what do you love? How does your life show that? 
We are living, you know, for those of you that have not yet decided to follow Christ, we are living in a time of grace. And we are offered peace with God. It's possible through Jesus Christ. To, to, to put your faith in Jesus Christ, meaning to know that Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross for our sins. To know that, to accept that that's reality, to accept that that's true, and then to place the weight of your life on him, meaning read his words, study it, understand it, apply it, live it out. That's what it means to put your faith in Christ. Will you accept it? Every single day I live, this world that we live in is just working as hard as it possibly can to suppress the truth. Even what can be seen to our obvious eyes is being suppressed and substituted with a lie. And I'm not talking about one specific thing. I'm talking about across the board. We are living increasingly in a time of untruth and falsehood. And God says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is Jesus talking. He says, no man comes to the Father except through me. Will you accept it? And then again, just a challenge. How do you think about Jesus' return in the future? It's wonderful to think about Jesus as the victorious conqueror, but it's also a bit sobering to think about that the church has got to be at the business at hand, which is to share the gospel and to make disciples. So let me leave you with these thoughts and, ch and a challenge as we, as we wrap up and go home. Number one, that grace and truth and wrath paradigm really, I think, is good as we approach unbelievers. Like, let's start with grace, right? Let's start with, you know, giving people what, that which they don't deserve if they're being rude or, or, or hostile to, a, to you as a Christian person. You start with grace, right? And then move into truth. Don't take, you know, use your judgment on when to, when to do that and how to do that. And eventually, right, we, we don't get to exercise God's wrath. He does. All we can do is, is separate from that person, right? And, and vengeance is mine, says the Lord, right? That's, that's God's job, not ours. But we need to be people of grace and truth. And then this Holy Week, I just want to challenge you each day to take some time right? If you've fallen off of your Bible reading and your prayer and your study and meditation, take some time this week to get that started again. And spend maybe a minute or two or, or several if you can, spend some time thinking about, is my, am I satisfied with the way that my life is being led and I'm doing a diligent job of following Jesus, yes or no? And if it's no, then make a plan to grow and change. And if you have a hard time with that, hey, that's why the Lord gave you pastors and elders. We're accessible for help. I'm not in an ivory tower somewhere. I have an office, and I'm here every day. I'll come to your house if you want me to. Eat your food. <laughs> Just saying. Some of you guys make good stuff. Let me wrap up by saying this. We started off our entire worship service today by singing the song, Hosanna. And there's a lyric in there that says, Come have your way among us. Do you mean that? When you sing that, do you mean, do you want the way of Christ to be functioning in your life and in this place? That day, during the triumphal entry, they did not mean it. And Christ was crucified. Father, you are always working on us because you're so gracious to us. You're constantly bringing to our minds by your Holy Spirit that there are areas and parts of our lives that need to be surrendered. There are sins that need to be repented of. There are new ways to live that need to be forged. We ask for your help this Holy Week as we move through it that we not only remember the grace that you've shown us and the truth that you've given us, but we also remember the wrath that is to come and that how we live in this place is critical. It's important because there are so many people that are looking at us, how we live, so many people that we have the opportunity to minister to 
such a more wonderful testimony that we could build if we just submitted this area or that area to you of our lives, repented of our sin, turned away from it, and gave it over to you. And so, Father, I, we just ask for your help in following your Son, Jesus Christ, not in just word and deed, but in our hearts. Be with us this Holy Week, Father. Transform our lives through your word, your Holy Spirit, and the fellowship of the saints together. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.